Seth Klarman is here. He is the legendary investor behind the Boston-based hedge fund, the Baupost Group. It is one of the world's most admired money managers and money, money market managing firms, I should say. Seth has taken on a project for the ages. Klarman is the editor of the seventh edition of Benjamin Graham and David Dodd's landmark investing Bible called Security Analysis. The seventh edition is out today. And Seth Klarman joins us right now in a Squawk Box exclusive interview. And Seth, first of all, welcome. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. You are um, somebody who shies away from publicity. I've been trying to get you to come on the show for years. So has Andrew. So we are thrilled to have you here today. Um, let's talk about the book that brought you here. Great. This book was first published back in 1934. Um, bad time for investing for a lot of people as you headed into what was the depths of the recession of the Great Depression. A lot has changed since that time. And I guess the first question is why? What, what brought you to come in and revise this and bring this version up to date? What made you do this? Yeah. So first of all, it was um, McGraw-Hill called. That's incredibly flattering. Um, I'd had a good experience working on the sixth edition where I was co-editor. And um, a lot had changed in the last 15 years. And I felt strongly that there were things that needed to be talked about. Um, and finally, I thought I could pull together a great team. Which you did. There's some pretty impressive contributions that came in. You've got Roger Lowenstein, Todd Combs, James Grant, um, a lot of people who did this. But what changed so drastically that you felt needed to be adjust, addressed over the last 15 years? Yeah. The first thing is we've been in an everything bubble, I think, that um, a lot of money has flowed into virtually everything. Um, historically low interest rates, even zero rates have um, precipitated that bubble. Um, you've also had a lot of changes in the business world. Technology has um, accelerated, if anything, and you've seen disruption of all kinds of businesses, which creates challenges and opportunities for investors. Um, so that's another thing. Um, some asset classes have become increasingly popular. Private credit has um, had, a, had a day in the sun. You've had um, uh, speculation during that bubble in all kinds of things from crypto to meme stocks to SPACs in, in a way that I think, and the book has some important reminders for people about the, the dangers of speculation and the importance of remembering what kind of environment you're in. When, when uh, Graham and Dodd first wrote this book, you were talking about a nation where the economy was really dominated by factories and railroads. You talk about things like SPACs, like cryptocurrency. It seems like a pretty different world. What, what is the common thread um, that kind of ties all of this together and how you look at the markets? One of the things I really admire about Graham and, and Dodd writing almost 90 years ago is they, they knew they were in an unusual environment being in, enmeshed in the Great Depression and yet they tried to write something for the ages. They said, we know this won't be the permanent condition, but we don't know what conditions we will experience. So I think every investor has that challenge that you have to look at the moment you're in and say, which part of this is real, which part of this may be enduring, and which part of this may look completely different as soon as tomorrow, and how do I position myself maintaining somewhat of a longer term perspective because I think trying to trade day to day is not a game anybody really is well equipped to win. You're, you're a value investor. What does that mean and what did you learn from Graham and Dodd? The academic definition of value is by the stock that's cheapest by the numbers. But I don't think that's what Graham and Dodd wanted. In fact, it's clear that they were talking about earnings power and the growth possibilities in a business, even if they're hard to determine. And so I think value has to be determined for every company. The way I think about the market is not that there are growth stocks and value stocks, but rather that all stocks may hold value, um, but that all stocks also could potentially be overvalued. So you have to have a mechanism, a rubric for figuring out the value of different kinds of assets, different kinds of businesses, and then figure out which ones are trading particularly mispriced. I always thought of, or I used to think of value investors as being people who would steer away from growth stocks, that that was a dangerous spot that would be hard to kind of figure out. That was pretty interesting that one of your big positions you've taken is in Coinbase. How do you figure out what the forward earnings are for that? How do you, especially when you start thinking about things that are hard to value, how do you get into that? How do you look at that and say, okay, this is a place that I definitely see value? Yeah. So I think 
in a world that's changing as fast as this one, it's really important to think about not just what are the earnings today. The earnings today may not be here tomorrow. They may be disrupted. The business may be gone or they may be 50 or 100 percent more. So I think investors need to take into account what are the longer term prospects for a business. I think investors have become vastly more sophisticated these days than in Graham and Dodd's era in terms of thinking about what causes a business to be resilient to competitive threats. Also, Warren Buffett has showed all of us the value of growth, that he um, thinks hard about some of the highest quality businesses in the world, but only buys them when they're at attractive prices. So I think that's an important element of it as well. What's gotten more complicated with the markets in the 40 plus years that you've been doing this? And by the way, I should say, when I asked Warren Buffett at one point, like people who could beat the market, because he's long talked about indexing, has always thought that indexing is the way to go. He's, there's probably about five people who could actually beat the markets over time. And you're one of the names that he that he listed on that, um, which is huge praise um, from one of the best investors ever. But what's changed for you over time as the markets have gotten more complicated, as there's been more competition? How, how has your style evolved? I think you have to almost run harder to stay in place, that you have more competitors, smarter competitors, more information is available at everybody's fingertips. Investors need edge to be successful. They need to think about what is it they know or how are they structured that will allow them to outperform, to create alpha for their clients in a way that, that buying the average stock won't do. And so we've become a little bit more focused on private investments. We think there's more inefficiencies in some private markets than public markets. We've become more global over time. When we started, we were a couple of people and $27 million, and today we're, we're almost you know, what, $25, $26 billion. So it's really been an evolution in 260 people. Um, I think that you can continue to find edge, though, um, in how you structure yourself, how you incentivize your team, how you lead your team. Um, you can find opportunities in, around the edges of what other people are doing, finding situations that other people are throwing out, like the baby with the bathwater. And they exist. It's, you have to be patient. They're not always there. But when they're there, they can be particularly attractive because the markets can become quite frenetic these days. You're always somebody who is bottoms up, not top down. So you're always looking at value from the company level up. Are there places that you see more opportunities today? I think that there are hunting grounds that one would want to look. Um, we think real estate is an area that is full of so many fundamental challenges, but the fundamental challenges have caused um, urgent selling. You can see a pullback in lending. You can see vacancies in office, troubles in retail for years and years. And so that doesn't automatically makes it interest, make it interesting, but it may mean that as other people abandon it, as other people face urgent pressure, there may be opportunities to buy, to inject capital, to make some rescue loans. And we hover around looking for opportunity, trying to meet counterparties that, that are eager to transact. We think we're a great counterparty for them because we can move quickly, we can write any size check, um, we can hold assets of any form, we can structure flexibly to meet the needs of our counterpart. And just in terms of the number of opportunities, more than you've seen in the past or, or no? I would say on the whole this environment feels like a four in terms of opportunity. With, with the um, ten being the best? Ten being the best. It's nowhere near, um, uh, you know, nine or ten. But it's better than it was. You had such extended valuations, such little downside volatility, really for the last decade or more. And 2021 was sort of a blow off. 2022 began the correction. Now you're starting to recover from that correction, but I'm not sure whether that's going to continue or not. But the, the nature of opportunity that we see on a bottom up basis is better than it was, but still not at, at peak. That, on the other hand, that means you should be waiting in because you don't know how low it might get or how large the opportunity set might get. And we've learned over 40 years that when you see something that's worth buying, something that provides an attractive return for the risk, you go ahead and buy some. Uh, Seth Klarman is going to be with us for the half hour. We're going to talk with them more after the break. But one point you did want to make, all the proceeds from the book are going where? 
any royalties I get are going to organizations that increase diversity on Wall Street. Girls Who Invest, which is a wonderful summer program for young college women, um, SEO, and Lighted Pathways, um, all of whom have internship programs that bring people um, into the business, make them aware of the business who may not have become, become aware of it any other way. And we ourselves have about a dozen interns this summer, and it's wonderful because people are getting their first experience on Wall Street. They won't all love it, um, they won't all stay, but a surprising number want to build careers. And so we actually have several full-time employees that came out of these internship programs. So the proceeds are going into that. It was so fascinating just to listen to you talking to Becky just now. The question I was going to ask is, if you could put yourself back now, you were talking about investing and how it's shifted over time. But if you were, and you were also talking about the private markets, how there's a lot more opportunity there. But if you were a kid coming out of college, and we're both uh, alma mater, uh, Cornell, but you graduated in 1979. But if you were graduating today and you had to actually play, if you will, the public markets, do you think that opportunity that you had in 1979 still exists in 2023? You know, Andrew, it's, it's such a great question. I think that markets can become more efficient. And it, there's a question in my mind about once the market becomes more efficient, whether it actually does um, have the likelihood of becoming less efficient afterwards. So for sure, there's more money in public markets. Things have become somewhat more efficient. But I also see a short-term orientation that tells me that it's possible some pricing has actually become less efficient. I think when you look at Meta, uh, the stock's been all over the place in, in a reasonably short period of time, um, falling to under 100, then rising back up to almost 300, li literally months apart. Um, for a large, well-established company that I think everybody can analyze. So I think that there are opportunities. Now, if, if a kid came to me and said, where do you think I should potentially make my career, I would encourage them to look for the most inefficient pockets in the world. Um, I also think it's important that they get mentored, that most people aren't ready to, to just jump right into this business right out of school. So I do think there are opportunities, but people should ask themselves, what, what are my interests? What kind of edge might I have? If, if you're from a different country, maybe you have great contacts in that country. Maybe you know a lot about the business culture in that country. And so my advice would be to go where you're naturally inclined and go where you think there may interest, be interesting opportunities. Obviously, a market that's setting all-time highs may not be the best place to, uh, right. to, to focus a career. Uh, this may not be about edge, but, you know, Warren Buffett's often talked about index funds. Becky was mentioning index funds to you before, which have changed the business. I think that's actually what's made them so much more efficient to a large degree. But do you also subscribe to the philosophy that if you can invest with Seth Klarman, that you should actually be investing in index funds? And that's that's the safer uh, and best path. You know, I, 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 the argument for index funds is that you're going to have low transaction costs near zero and you're going to have um, exposure to the market. You're not going to underperform the market, but neither will you outperform the market. I think for um, the average person out there who isn't um, terribly sophisticated um, and is able to take a long-term view, I don't see anything wrong with index funds. But I think that one of the critical things about the long-term return from investing is that it depends on the entry price. So if you enter when the market's very expensive at a high valuation, you may be disappointed because you might match the index, but the index may not do very well from there. So uh, the, the other thing is you don't want to go into index funds, experience a bad market, and then bail out. That's what investors tend to do. Right. Um, they get in at the wrong time and they get out at the wrong time. And so it, investors who go into index funds should go in with the idea that they're going to stay through thick and thin. And you were talking also with Becky about technology. I wanted to understand how you think about the inflection point with a technology company. There, of course, was a point where Amazon might have seemed like a speculation. Today, in retrospect, you wouldn't think that. You might even look at Tesla that way. There are some people in the public market, in the, in the public right now, who think that Bitcoin and, and various cryptocurrencies are complete and utter speculation. There are others who say, 10 years from now, we're going to look back and say, that wasn't, that wasn't one. How do you think about that distinction? 
You know, Andrew, one of the things that's really important, there's a, a, an enormous amount of fire hose of information coming at all of us all the time. And as an investor, I've learned to try to be focused on things that actually are going to move the needle for me and my portfolio. So I try to focus on bottom-up individual situations, stocks, bonds, um, real estate um, transactions, and I don't spend a lot of time thinking about things where I think the answer is pretty imponderable. So I do spend time thinking about technology, and part of that, at least, is to avoid being on the wrong side, to avoid being in a company that gets disrupted. I think something like crypto, which I've tried hard to understand the arguments and figure out why people are so excited about it, and I can't find value there. So I'm not making a judgment that it might not go up. I have no idea. But we focus our time where we think we might spend it productively for about. But, but what about Coinbase, Seth? We don't own Coinbase stock. Our team is um, focused in the sector because there's been so much trouble in the sector. Yeah. So we actually are invested in convertible bonds in Coinbase. And the convert feature is way out of the money. But the bonds are quite well protected we believe, but by, if you, by the balance sheet. If you were convinced it truly was uh, tulip mania, would you still have the converts? There's more asset value in the company. The company's sitting on... Po the than possibly Bitcoin itself. The something. company's sitting on $5 billion of cash and has less than that in debt. So we believe our bonds are covered by cash, and we have... We think companies doing some smart things, and the business is actually cash flow positive. But it is not a bullish bet on Coinbase. Would it be? Would it absolutely shock you if the nature of money going back thousands of years? That's what the the, the Bitcoin um, advocates tie it to something similar to gold in terms of a store of value. Since it's got six characteristics that are very similar to gold, six or seven that are similar. Would it absolutely shock you if it became the internet of money and had a, a future like that for the unbanked around the world? Yeah, so I, I hear you, Joe, and I think there are characteristics. Um, it's convenient that there's a limited supply based on solving um, mathematical right. um, problems. But I wonder if that's important or whether it just is uh, intentional just to make it look like gold in that respect. Gold has thousands of years of history. Humans in many countries will go to gold during times of crisis or just to accumulate wealth. But I wouldn't say it's impossible the thing that I think is quite different is there are hundreds, maybe a thousand different cryptocurrencies, and you don't have a thousand paper currencies in your wallet, and I don't either. I have one, and I'm sure you do too. And so I worry that it's a seductive idea. It, it, I called it once catnip for techies, that it's exciting, and you can imagine that you're getting on the ground floor of technological gold, but I, I'm a skeptic. But I would never say nothing, you know, something can't happen. Seth, uh, I'm out here in Aspen at this Ideas Festival. Uh, Larry Fink and a whole bunch of uh, CEOs and others are, are here. Uh, lots talking about whether we are going to be entering a recession, of what the next 12 months really looks like, how much the Fed uh, is uh, going to raise or not. And, and just as importantly, there's a huge conversation here, frankly, about something you've written a lot about, which is democracy um, and the politics of our country and what's happening uh, throughout, throughout, throughout the U.S. and what's going to happen over the next year. So I don't know if you want to take, take a crack at both and how connected they very well may be. Uh, I, Andrew, I think that my forecasts about the economy are kind of like sports talk radio, that I have an opinion, but I'm not sure I would, I would let myself run that team. I'm, I'm, I think we probably will have a downturn. The economy is slowing. Many sides of, of the inflation equation are coming under better control. Um, but the goal of the Fed is to reduce the heat in the economy. And one way to do that is to trigger some kind of recession. It's been slow developing. Some people think that the excess cash in people's pockets will start to run out around year end. So maybe it's an early 2024 event. Maybe it isn't. But my investing style doesn't require me to have a view. And I think in a way it's dangerous to have a view because you can get distracted from the actual values that are out there. In terms of democracy, I think what's happening is sad for our country and deeply worrisome. I think Americans need to find a way to pull together to support candidates who will work with the other side, candidates who will pledge to 
um, put their faith in democracy, not suppress votes and not change outcomes of elections. And that um, this is not just a U.S. phenomenon, it actually, you know, rise in authoritarianism it seems to be a worldwide phenomenon. But democracy is under threat, and every single person should take that as a serious problem um, that, that they can do something about by getting out and voting and by supporting candidates who are decent and, and they'd be happy with... I, I want to get to where we can have elections where it, that both candidates are so good that you're okay whoever wins. <laughs> Instead of I'm neither. Have that. <laughs> Instead of neither. <laughs> right. Seth Klarman, uh, we want to thank you. Uh, as Becky said at the top, uh, we've been trying to get you on TV for a very long time. We really appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with you.